I'll show this, I'll share my screen. Um, let me just All right, so it looks something like uh, that one there. So if you have any questions during the session, please uh, post them here and um, we'll address them at the end. Lisa, is that all right? That's the plan at the end, question and answers? That's, that's fine. Uh, do you want me to access the document too or will you just feed the questions to me? Yeah, I'll, I'll share the screen and we can then discuss it. It will probably be easier to call out names. So when you're po uh, po posting your questions, please um, write your name so we know who you are. And also, if there's any other question that someone else has posted, you can always vote it up. So if you vote it up, we'll know, okay, that's something we need to address and we can do them. Do that right, like at the start. Uh, so once again, thanks for joining us. Um, Thanks, Lisa, for joining us um, and for accepting our invite and request a very short notice. And Lisa is, of course, joining us from um, Germany. So I think it's about 8 a.m. for Lisa there. Um, so a bit about Lisa. Lisa is actually at the University of Oldenburg in Germany. She's the director, program director uh, for the management of technology enhanced learning at the Center for Learning and um, Center for Lifelong Learning. Uh, Lisa was previously uh, an associate professor at the University of Maryland, um, teaching in the Master of Distance Education and e-learning program. So Lisa has got quite a bit of knowledge on distance and online education. Um, um, and, and she will uh, be sharing a few tips and strategies um, according to what has worked, having worked in that sort of realm for, uh, for a few years. Um, so um, if I stop sharing uh, my screen, I'm pretty sure um, we all know why we're here. I mean, obviously, obviously um, COVID happened and quite a lot changed. And uh, my background, actually Thomas criticizing my background, my background kind of captures the first phase of who, have, who we have been as an academic in this phase. It's like we have hit the dawn, a, a new suit and venture into uncharted territory and learn things, learn things very fast, things which we hadn't done before. Uh, we, our identity actually changed when the work and home boundary got blurred overnight. Uh, and we do it out of care and uh, conduct and professional conduct for our students. And obviously we want to do what's best for them. And at that juncture, I think Tom and I very briefly discussed about uh, inviting Lisa in, um, in getting hard to share what might work post what we've been, uh, what we have experienced. So most of the universities in Australia and New Zealand, probably around the world are just finishing or already have finished the first semester where we actually had to move to online teaching overnight. So um, that's where Lisa comes in. So Lisa, should I hand it over? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Vickle. Thank you both Tom and Vickle for the invitation today. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to talk to you about this. I've been doing a lot of uh, work in the last uh, couple of months, working with um, with with instructors and uh, and uh, you know a lot of new people in the field uh, of online learning uh, who are trying to help people to transition to to working in an online environment. Um, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to to talk with you today. And I just also want to say thank you for moving the time so that I didn't have to get up at three thirty in the morning to talk to you. <laughs> yes, stop. Um, so first, I want to say congratulations. You made it. You made it through the emergency phase. So everybody deserves a, a big round of applause for 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 managing that. And. Today, what I'd like to talk about is uh, some of the, the ways that we can start preparing for the next phases that are coming along. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Okay. Put this on presentation mode. Yep, all good. Okay. Great. How does that look? Yeah, it's great. Thanks. Yeah. Super. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and Vickles already told you a little bit about me. I'm actually not German, just so that everyone knows. I'm actually from the United States. I was just telling, uh, telling the guys that I'm um, from uh, Minneapolis, uh, was born in St. Paul and grew up, some, grew up just uh, a couple of blocks away from, from where all of this is happening. 
uh, in the U.S. right now. So it's been kind of a chaotic time in addition to the pandemic and all of the online craziness. So, so my first question is for you is how have you experienced teaching during COVID-19? Uh, have, has it been smooth sailing? Have you, you know, gone through that process, you know, got on the ship and sailed across the water in the sunshine without any, any, you know, any challenges or difficulties along the way? Or has it been a bit like the experience of this music teacher in the YouTube video that has actually, you know, it's been all over the internet. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Has, has anybody seen this video? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, she basically talks about how it's how it's been a very stressful time for her and how she writes music to uh, in order to manage that stress and to deal with the challenges that that she encounters in the classroom. Uh, and so she wrote a little song and I, um, I really encourage you to look at it because uh, it's actually quite funny, the kind of song that she sings. But uh, first, though, I want to talk about I guess not first, but uh, what I'd like to do is, is start by sharing this graphic from Phil Hill, who's done a lot of a uh, lot of stuff on ed tech in in the last few years, uh, blogging and publishing, and he has he's put together a graphic of of the phases of the higher education response, things that we're dealing with within higher education as instructors, as institutions, as leaders, uh, and the transitions that we're going through and. He's described phase one, which I think most of us have already gone through, which is the, uh, which he calls the rapid transition to remote teaching and learning. Um, I have referred to it as emergency remote teaching and learning, um, rather than just rapid transition. I suppose that one and the same, but uh, it's really emergency brings across something, uh, I think, much more articulate about the experience for most people. Uh, and that's like overnight, we had to move everything into an online environment. Um, and now I think, now that we've gotten through that first phase, most of us are now dealing with the second phase, which is adding the basics uh, and perhaps even moving into the uh, phase three, which is extending the transition. Uh, and although there's continued turmoil, um, we're starting to establish, you know, what direction are we going in? Uh, what do we plan on doing in the long term? And I'm going to focus on those two phases today and, talk, and really try to provide you with some tips and some ideas about how you might go about, you know, dealing with uh, this next phase in the in the transition. I hear a lot in education at the moment um, that online education or online learning is is kind of a, a deficient substitute, of, uh, but it's an unescapable solution uh, to the current situation. Um, and historically, distance education has been like the poor stepbrother of, of higher education and has, has been shunned by a, a number of uh, instructors. And the debate has gone on for years about which is better, online or traditional face-to-face. -face. Um, and interestingly enough, there have been many studies that have shown that blended learning, the mix of the two, is actually uh, more productive and efficient in realizing student learning outcomes. So um, I see this really as an opportunity and, and what I'm trying to focus on is not the deficits of the online learning, but the opportunities that we have. So what you're going to see in my presentation um, is I'm going to be mentioning those opportunities with each of the different uh, phases that, I, or not phases, but components that I talk about. Um, and the areas that I, that I chose to focus on, and I was telling Bickle and Tom in the beginning that there's so much that I could focus on right now um, that I really, tried to pick the three that I thought were the most important and have the most impact in the long term uh, for uh, instructors and for students uh, in this next phase of, of transitioning to online. And those are the three areas of a design of your courses, assessment within courses, and support and care. So those will be the three that I focus on. And, um, and I've also tried to pr provide practical tips. And as you can see, there's a big list of resources in that Google Doc. Those will be mentioned throughout this presentation. Uh, some of them are OERs, some of them are open educational resources. Uh, others are resources that you might be able to get over your library or that uh, you may want to purchase. So within each of the areas of design, assessment, care, and self-care, 
uh, I've provided overall tips that I'll then dive deeper into in the next in the next slides. Uh, I'll identify some key opportunities and then give one big tip for for that particular area that I see as as critical. Um, as Vickel mentioned, this is really based on first studying in the field, uh, learning about e-learning and online learning, and and then working within uh, online learning. I've been an instructor for what 2007. So the 12 years, um, and before that, was stud were, I was studying within the field of, of online learning, um, and I've also worked within industry. So I'm very aware of the kinds of challenges there are in moving into an online environment. So the first area that I'd like to talk about is design. How can we design and structure our courses uh, to help our students um, to learn most effectively? And these are some of the things that, that, that I think that we can do at this point to really prepare ourselves uh, for the future and to, uh, to begin building courses that will be sustainable over time. And one of the first tips that I like to give is applying backward design. Uh, and then the second is engaging students in dialogue, developing their, student, uh, developing their self-directed learning skills, and of course, choosing technology. And the overall tip that I would give in terms of design is, is to give your students an opportunity uh, within this online environment to explore, to collaborate, connect, to share and reflect. There's a lot of opportunities, a lot of for affordances that technology offers. So try to use as best you can. So the first tip is um, applying backward design. And that really is, you know, ident identifying desired learning outcomes, um, determining how you want to assess if those, account, uh, if those outcomes have been achieved, um, and then define your learning content and activities to align with the learning outcomes. Uh, some people would say that applying backward design uh, or using black backward design is, is really just basic good teaching practice. And I agree with that. Uh, I don't see a lot of it uh, within traditional face-to-face -face courses. Uh, so this is really for those of you that, that haven't made that, made that move into moving things into a backward design uh, kind of approach. One of the good things that I, that I find or that with backward design and that I think applies really well within the online learning environment is you're forced to really identify specific learning outcomes that you want the students to achieve. And then once you've defined those, there might be three or four, maybe four or five different outcomes, then you start to really define your course or design your course around those learning outcomes. Um, and as a result, your, your course becomes a lot more learner-centered. The, uh, the assessment, how, you're, how are you going to assess whether they've achieved their outcomes? So your assessments become much more learner-centered. Your, your content, the activities that you define become more learner-centered because you're looking for content that's going to support the student in realizing the outcomes and you're designing activities that is going to support the student in, uh, in achieving these learning outcomes. So it, it is very good uh, practice as a teacher uh, or as a designer to use backward design, uh, but I think it works really well for the online environment. You also have an opportunity to incorporate open educational resources. And this is something that I found um, instructors at first uh, push back on this. Um, we've had this, we, we just moved to open educational resources within the Center for Lifelong Learning within our courses. And, and we did get some pushback because people wanted to use their books. And, uh, but what they found was as they moved into open educational resources and, and research that I've done in this area has also shown this, um, as they move into open educational resources, their courses became more learner centered because they were picking specific pieces of information that were going to support the learner, as I mentioned before, in achieving specific learning outcomes. And they were bringing in resources that they could, that, that, that they could then switch out later as, as necessary. Maybe the information becomes more outdated or there's a better resource out there. Uh, another, um, another plus, of course, is that uh, it's less expensive for students uh, because if it's an open education resource, they don't have to pay for it. There's two resources that I've included here. One of them is from Wiggins and McTyke, who write about the backward design approach, and then an Eden webinar uh, with a number of experts uh, within uh, learning and instructional design. One of them, I think, Joyce Seisinger is from uh, New Zealand and from Australia. She's, uh, she was at this webinar as well as Julie Salmon and uh, Gerald Evans from the OU. So I encourage you to look at that. 
Now, the next area that I really want to encourage you to uh, to focus on is dialogue. And dialogue, Michael Moore defines dialogue as something that's purposeful and constructive and beneficial and valued by everyone who is part of the discussion. Um, they're respectful and active listeners and each is a contributor and they build their ideas upon each other uh, within the learning environment. So what you really wanna do is you want to engage in active dialogue with your students. And a first step toward creating that dialogue is to move your lectures out of the classroom. And this is uh, often called flipped learning. Um, it's when you take your lectures, you move them out of the classroom, and in this case, moving them out of the online classroom. And, and when I say moving out of the online classroom, I don't mean if you've recorded your videos to take them out. What I am saying is try to move away from synchronous online learn, uh, lectures. What often happens, at least this is happening in Germany, is students are told that they are supposed to come to class at a specific time and then they sit through a two-hour lecture as their as their professor teaches them uh, doing the same thing they've done always which is show the show the presentation lecture to them for for an hour to two hours uh, and then the students leave the classroom and what i encourage you to do is to um, you don't have to move away from the lecture completely um, but I would, I would really encourage you to focus on some specific topics that you want to discuss around a theme within your course uh, and then allow the students to, to respond to that, to ask questions, to get into a dialogue with each other and with you, uh, where they're actually uh, going through a, a process of inquiry about different topics, um, how it relates perhaps to their own personal experience or to their professional experience. And, and to really have these discussions within the classroom and maximize the time uh, in the online classroom um, for this discussion and for this inquiry and, and also the use of asynchronous communication. I'm a big fan of asynchronous communication. A lot of our students um, in the programs that I've taught in uh, are a, uh, not native uh, speakers of, of, of the English language. And so this actually gives them a voice within the classroom. They have an opportunity uh, to, to speak. You, you've always got that one student that, you know, is, is always the one who speaks up during the classroom and this really democratizes the, the, the communication uh, opportunities or the opportunities for students to speak up and have a voice in the classroom. So uh, when you design, be sure to design for dialogue. And I've included two resources here. One is from Beria Holmberg and this is an open educational resource that we offer through the um, through the University of Oldenburg uh, that is available online and it discusses a lot of things about student content interaction, student um, student student interaction, student instructor interaction, different principles about online learning. And even though it's a, a dated um, uh, resource, I encourage you to, to look into it because it's got a lot of information about uh, distance education and online learning. And then the second one is from Palif and Pratt, and that's a uh, one you'd need to buy, and that's building learning communities in cyberspace, some of the strategies. And I'm recommending these because these are really books that have shaped my approach to teaching and to the work that I've done within the classroom. So um, I guess I'm kind of giving you a little, little of a consulting uh, bit as, as well as, as uh, giving it, it well, giving advice and doing consulting, but I, I want to be able to provide you with, with some of the really important pieces of, of information that have, that have helped uh, form my approach. Now, self-directed learning, um, and it's, I think it's really important uh, at, that we develop learning, uh, self-directed learning skills. Uh, Knowles writes about self-directed learning, uh, or andragogy for those of you who are more familiar with that term, uh, where it's the main purpose of education is to uh, make our students um, to develop the skills of inquiry and to take them, uh, to allow them to take more initiative, really giving them more responsibility for their learning, uh, which can be very challenging for students at first because most of them are accustomed to a more passive approach to learning. 
And so what we want to do is, is to move them into a place where they're making decisions about learning. And this can be things uh, about, for example, um, allowing them to make decisions about what they're going to learn uh, and, and how they're going to learn it. Uh, you, may allow, uh, you may want to give them an opportunity to design or co-design the curriculum or the learning activities, the assessments. And the instructor takes kind of a step back and becomes a guide on the side. Um, I'm not going to talk about hoidagogy, which is my big area that, that I like to talk about. Um, and and Bickle and Tom both know about hoidagogy and, and my work there. So, but, but this giving them self-directed learning skills moves them into more self-determined learning, which is, which is hoidagogy, where, they're, where they really are designing their courses or designing their learning for themselves and trying to establish skills for lifelong learning. Um, it's, get, it's taking away what a lot of people say, uh, the power of the instructor within the classroom and, and giving that more to the student. It's making the student, as I said, more responsible for their work, uh, but it's also, um, it's also making them, uh, giving them more agency to make decisions about their learning. Uh, the opportunity that I see here, uh, it, it gives them responsibility and it helps them to build their lifelong learning skills. And this picture is actually a picture of my daughter. Uh, most of the pictures I've included here are open educational resources, but some of them are, are from my own little catalog. And uh, this is a picture of when she uh, learned how to canoe. She told me she did know how to canoe. And then once we got into the water, I realized that that wasn't the case. Uh, and so uh, we had to do some quick learning very, uh, we had to do some learning very quickly. So media choice, oh, that's probably one of the most important design tips for choosing your media and you need to do it carefully. Uh, you need to select media that supports learning. Many of you may have been told what media to use uh, or you've been forced to use a certain media that your uh, institution has, has, uh, has said that you should use or perhaps some of you are experimenting with different media, different technologies that you can incorporate into the classroom. And the thing, the, the rule of thumb that I use when using media and I try to incorporate as much as I can because I see lots of opportunities with incorporating technology and media in the classroom for my students um, is always think about, is this going to be meaningful for my student? Will What's the, pedagog what's the pedagogical reason for including this? Uh, is it a pedagogically meaningful? And, and are the students actually learning by using this? Or is it more of a cognitive overload to learn the technology um, and, and so they're losing out on the activity uh, entirely? Uh, and so what I try to do is, is I, I think about what Terry Anderson said, uh, Terry Anderson's written extensively uh, about online learning um, and distance learning. And he says that, that, the, that you should incorporate technology to support theory and practice. Um, and he calls it a complex dance between technologies and uh, pedagogies uh, that quality distance, and from that quality distance education emerges. The technology sets the beat and the timing and the pedagogy defines the moods. So when you're designing using, uh, when you're designing your courses to incorporate technology, it, it, it needs to be a good balance. It needs to really work together like a, a, like a well-defined orchestra. Uh, and so um, I really encourage you to, to think you know, very carefully about the media that you use and try, and, and a lot of it depends upon your specific context because you may be, um, serving a, an audience of students that, that don't have access to a lot of technology. I have that situation uh, at my, um, within my program because a number of our students are from the University of South Africa uh, and don't have a lot of access to the internet. So make sure that it adds pedagogical value. If you need a, uh, if you need a model to make decisions about incorporating technology, I can highly recommend the model from Tony Bates. Uh, which is the sections model, and it looks at each of those different components of students, ease of use, cost, teaching, and media selection, and so, uh, and, um, and so on, uh, and, and, then, and then, you know, basically just makes a decision about whether to incorporate a technology based on how that technology uh, can be evaluated within each of those different, uh, within each of the different areas. 
Um, and finally, I recommend maximizing the use of the internet. Uh, it gives students uh, an opportunity to develop their digital skills, and it also gets them into a stage of exploration, um, and it's learning related. And if you need a model, again, uh, I, I think Bates' model is very good. And he describes that model uh, in his book, which is an open educational resource, uh, which I highly, highly recommend, uh, Teaching in a Digital Age, Guidelines for Designing, Teaching and Learning. Is, uh, so definitely download that. Uh, McLaughlin and Lee wrote a, a paper that I, that I found to be very, very seminal uh, in, in terms of, of looking at how we can incorporate Web 2.0 and social media into our courses um, and social software and the choices that we can make. And this is really about the technology affordances. What can the, what can the technology do for us? Uh, and then there's George Feliciano's book, uh, Emerging Technologies in Distance Education. And these are all uh, available as open educational resources. The next area that I'd like to talk about is assessment. And it's probably one of the most challenging um, areas for teachers and many, many teachers have asked me, um, you know, how can I be sure that my students are actually the people at the other end of the computer and how can I be sure that they aren't cheating uh, and um, what, should I use a proctoring service for exams or should I use a plagiarism tool like Turnitin? Um, my tip here is, is trust that they won't. Trust that your students won't, cheese, won't cheat and, and design your assessments so that they can't. Uh, it's, it's really, um, you need to find broader and deeper ways to get to know your students and to recognize whether or not they're cheating. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, most of the students that I find that cheat, cheat for other reasons. Um, it's not because, uh, not because they really want to cheat, but because they feel they have no choice. Perhaps they don't have the skills to complete the assessment. Perhaps they've run out of time. Um, so here I would recommend uh, trying to be as flexible as possible. Um, if you do use play, plagiarism tools like Turnitin, remember that Turnitin often, you know, it, it, it isn't a tool to identify the, um, uh, the, the rule breakers. Uh, it, it's, really, it's really an attempt to look at where can you support your students. So if I use tools like that, I try to use them to support my students where I'm looking at where can they improve on their citation. So I don't report them first thing if they have plagiarized something, unless it's an entire paper. Uh, I, I try to help them to build on their skills. Um, so try to commit, so my focus on, in this section is going to be on uh, creating assessment that minimizes cheating. And the first um, recommendation that I have uh, is designing for authentic assessment. And that's really designing, um, designing assessments that are contextual and relevant. Uh, one example, what, what I have done in, in courses, um, I'll ask students to identify a problem within their organization and then, and then you know, look at different potential so, uh, solutions and, de and develop a uh, elevator pitch for their CEO or, or management to, to talk about how can that be improved upon. This makes it very contextual. It makes it very um, uh, specific to the student. Uh, so the student has to really focus on their own context uh, without copying something from someone else. So try to find si assignments that are meaningful and relevant uh, and try to design so that you're incorporating the student's experience in their context. Uh, and what I've also done is to incorporate uh, smaller um, skill building exercises. I usually combine these with uh, learning activities with, with um, with the content and knowledge that they've acquired and then a digital, uh, a digital skill building activity that, that combines both of those uh, where they can apply what they've learned in practice. Here are again a couple of OERs that are helpful um, on authentic assessment. And the examples that I'm gonna talk about next are actually examples of how you can apply authentic assessment within the classroom. And the first is reflective practice. Um, it isn't just reflecting on, uh, and here I recommend incorporating reflective learning journals in the course activities. Um, it isn't just about reflecting on what you've learned. Uh, it's also about how you've learned it. Uh, a lot of students, it, what they, they, I'm, take a step back. 
the, the really positive thing about incorporating reflective learning journals is that you can see development of the student over time. Um, you also, if it's an online journal, you have an opportunity to pop in at any time to see how the student is doing and to get an idea of where you can provide support, where the student might be struggling. Uh, and it also gives students an outlet. It gives them an opportunity to reflect on their experiences, relate them to what's going on in their current environment, which I think right now, uh, because the world is going a little bit crazy, uh, it gives them an opportunity to, to really have that outlet uh, to reflect on their experiences. Then what it also does uh, is uh, it, it can help them in, in moving toward deeper, more reflective thinking. And, and the way that you need to do that is to, is to give them formative feedback. Not all students can reflect right away. Uh, some students have to be moved along to a place where they can start reflecting. What, what I will often see uh, is some students will be really, really good at reflecting and, and critical thinking about different topics and relating it to their own experience. Uh, whereas other students will just basically reflect back what they read in the text uh, and not engage in a, a deeper reflection uh, about their experience. So it's um, important to provide them with formative feedback, perhaps give them questions as springboards for reflection. And here I've included um, a, a book which, which um, has deeply influenced my, my approach to, to teaching uh, from Donald Shun on the Reflective Practitioner. Uh, and then an uh, article that I wrote together with, with Jane Brindley on how to use uh, reflective learning journals within the classroom, and that is also an OER. Not to overemphasize, but it really gives students an opportunity to reflect on their knowledge and practice, and it gives you an opportunity to have a holistic view of your student. I've learned so much about my students through their re reflective journals. Finally, uh, the ePortfolio is another form of authentic assessment that I recommend. Um, it, it's, it can be part of, the, the learning journal can actually be part of this ePortfolio, uh, which is a bigger form of authentic assessment. Uh, Barrett, who, is, who I've listed here as a, as a resource, talks about two faces of, of ePortfolios, one that has more of a inner looking side where, you're, where you're, the students are gathering together their reflections, they're gathering together their artifacts, things that they've compiled over time. It's more of a repository of information, uh, of products that they've produced uh, during their studies. And then there's the second phase, which is more of the showcasing of, of, and promotion of the students' work for the outside, where they're really putting together, this is me, this is what I've learned, this, these are the best pieces of my work and the competencies and the skills that I've, I've acquired. And so um, what the ePortfolio does, it, it gives students an opportunity to reflect on their, on their skills and competencies, and also to build their digital literacy skills. Uh, it, it's also highly relevant and very individualized and authentic. And it's something that they can then showcase, use to showcase their skills for future employers. And in fact, the, the example that I show here um, is from one of my students, Brenda, uh, who I later hired to work for me in our program. So the last area that I would like to talk about is support and care. And the tips that I've given here are the first is uh, specific to students and the next two are specific to instructors because I don't think and I, it's probably in the case in the first phase of this transition uh, where we didn't really care enough about ourselves. We were so busy taking care of everyone else that we really didn't have an opportunity to care for ourselves. So I'm going to talk about the first part and then move into the second. Um, Learner support is different for the online learner. Uh, it's, in some ways, I think it's tougher to support a student uh, from a distance uh, and it's more challenging because you're trying to establish relationships of trust and respect with that student and it's, and it's much more difficult to, um, to achieve that in an online environment because of the distance. I mean, Michael Moore talks about transactional distance and that psychological distance that the student experiences uh, from being at a distance and, and crossing through that, crossing over that through dialogue and through structure and, by, uh, and through the uh, learner autonomy um, in, his, in his theory. So I really, um, it's, it's, you need to be able to try to engage with your students as much as possible. And in order to do that, you have to show empathy with them. 
Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, and my tip overall for all of this, uh, this topic is, is practice self-care so that you can care for and support others. So um, for, for helping students, um, as I mentioned before, empathy is really key. It's not, I don't mention it right here on, on this slide in terms of a tip I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, but it's, it's very important that you show empathy. And you may do that through uh, the way that you respond to student posts, the way that you write emails, uh, the, the kinds of support that you provide within the classroom, um, being understanding of their situation, uh, allowing for more flexibility, uh, giving them guidance for learning online is one way, uh, understanding how they're going to use uh, the, helping them to understand how they'll use the learning environment, um, including examples of, of, um, of for example, videos or, or resources that will support them. We include within all of our courses uh, an area for learner support. And this is just basic information on how to work in an online environment. It's things like, uh, how to, uh, you know, different guidelines for making posts, how to write a reflection, um, things like um, uh, how to use the library, uh, things like, um, you know, getting support from outside of the classroom if you need technical support. So we try to keep one area of the classroom where students can go to to get information that they need uh, that will support them. But then there's other things that we incorporate throughout the course to support students. Um, for example, one of the things that we developed are writing tips. Uh, and these aren't things that we, we just give to students all at the beginning and say, here, read all of these. We try to build them into the design of the course. So for example, one of the learning activities that students have uh, is they need to define a, a research topic and then do a scan of, of the environment and then write annotations for each of their each of the document each of the research articles that they've found and we, we provide for example you know how to use the library how do you, how do you scan the library how do you choose the top, uh, how do you choose really good uh, sources of information either on the internet or, or within scholarly journals uh, and then we'll also um, give them advice on how to write an annotation and so these are built in to the week in which they have to actually uh, do these learning activities so we try to make sure that we provide support uh, within the classroom itself uh, another piece of advice that i would give is uh, in addition to scaffolding your learning activities is to try to create uh, an environment where they can fail uh, and that there won't be penalty one of the ways that you can do that is to uh, give them pass fail grades on um, on their on their work uh, and give them progress reports on if if i were to grade you today this is the grade that you would receive or you might want to practice ungrading entirely and uh, if you want to know more about ungrading, you should read up. Uh, Jesse Stommel has written uh, quite a bit about this, uh, and it seems to be something of a movement within online environments at the moment. So it may be something you might be interested in looking at more closely. Um, also allow learners to learn and support each other and you, because a lot of times our learners know a lot more about how to use technology than we do. So try to create an environment uh, where there's uh, trust and empathy where, and where students feel safe and supported. And I think that, um, that online learning gives that, us that opportunity. Okay, care and self-care. Um, try to be flexible and show empathy, as I mentioned before, with your students. And then I move into more here of things that you can do as an instructor for yourself, uh, which is to learn to say no. Uh, this is something that uh, is, is very challenging over, over time. It's, it's not easy to say, um, it's not easy to say no. I've gotten a lot of uh, requests for support, which, which I say yes to. But then at the same time, I've gotten a lot of requests to review journal articles. Apparently, there are some people in the world that are having lots and lots of time during the lockdown to write journal articles. Uh, and so they're sending them out now for review and I've had to turn them down because it's just not possible for me to support uh, teachers in transition and to review journal articles at the moment. So learning to say no is important. Going offline is important. Um, if I wanted to, I would say I could probably spend all of my time at my computer. Um, and sometimes I just have to learn to say no and just 
go offline, close my computer and walk away. Uh, the other piece of advice is remember it's a marathon and it's not a race. Uh, the Germans like to say you need to have the long breath. And so I think that's some good advice for, for how to get through the situation is to have that long breath and to, to take each day as it comes and know that this is going to be a, a longer transition. It's not going to be something that we can, that, that's going to go away overnight. We're now in a, in a space of a, a new normal. And the resource that I can re recommend here uh, is an Eden webinar that uh, we did um, a, co a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is um, on the question of care, where a number of specialists and, and professionals and teachers provided input on how to care and self-care during the pandemic. So professional development is going to be my last tip for, today, for the day, uh, and that is really, um, to take the time to develop professionally now, uh, if you have that opportunity to experiment um, and, and try out different technologies within your classroom and, and let yourself fail. I mean, you're not going to be able to, to know right away which technologies to use, which will be the most successful. Uh, read up on online and distance learning theory. I've talked about a couple of different theories today, like andragogy and hoidagogy and, and transactional distance, but there are a number of other theories out there which are, which I think are, are, are really helpful. Uh, social constructivism, connectivism, um, uh, industrialization theory, uh, a number of different theories. And all of the books that, that I've, or the resources that I've identified um, are very helpful here. Uh, participate in online communities of practice and social media. Um, I, I can't emphasize that more. Um, I, I met Vickle and Tom, for example, uh, over I think over Twitter um, or over Stuart, but I definitely was, was in a social media environment. And so I can highly recommend um, joining the social media. You get a lot of ideas, you get a lot of information, you can ask people for help or for support. So try to use your network as much as possible um, or develop a network, uh, personal learning uh, environment, personal learning network, where you can bring in all of those pieces uh, so that you can learn from the experience of others. Uh, and finally, um, this gives you an opportunity to, to gain knowledge from your personal learning network and to really build on your teaching skills. And if I haven't mentioned it before, get to know the instructional designer within your organization. Uh, get to know them better because they have a lot of really good ideas. And the resource that I've included here is from Susan Coe uh, and Rosen, and that is uh, Teaching Online. This book, uh, I read this book, I think after about 10 years of teaching online, and when I read it, I thought, man, I really wish somebody had given me this book when I first started teaching online because it tells me everything I needed to know when I would have needed it. Uh, and so, um, definitely recommend this book and I don't think it's a really expensive book either and I think you could probably get it used in an earlier edition. So what is ahead? What do we have facing us? Uh, and here I would, I think Susan Johnson, or Elizabeth Johnson, she summarized this really well in a recent article about what's going to be happening in this next phase of, of education. It's really a time for us to reflect um, where we are, where we've come, where we're going to be moving to next. Where can there be improvements? How can I better utilize technology? Kind of a home improvement for the online space. Um, you know, look at trying to cultivate that, that uh, uh, culture for online education, uh, giving students, uh, you know, more information about the benefits and the opportunities of, of, um, of, of online education, online learning, uh, providing more support, different kinds of support for students, uh, preparing them for the online learning environment uh, better. And uh, also there, there's a lot of activities for our leadership um, a lot of responsibility for our leadership and management in moving us forward uh, as we further transition into online. And that, you know, you can take a role in this as well. This isn't just for leaders that they, that they are the only ones that are planning and building and strategizing for the future. Uh, you can, for example, provide them with uh, different tools that they could use, for example, the sections model uh, from Bates. So the focus is really on, on realizing things that, that are sustainable uh, at, over time and that will give us a, a long-term return on investment. Finally, I, I'd like to end with uh, 
with a quote from uh, Neil Fassini, who, who, Fassina, who is president of Athabasca University and president of ICDE, which he gave last week at a, or, or this week at the Eden webinar, um, where we, a number of different leaders were talking about the directions that, that we're going in right now uh, in online and business learning and the impact that this will have. And this resonated with me because he says, we have an opportunity to plan for the future that we want. Uh, and, and so we need to grasp that opportunity and start planning for that future uh, and, and not just accept what we're given, uh, but start to plan for the future that we want. And so uh, I would like to end uh, my presentation with that quote and then answer your questions. Thank you, Lisa, for fitting in so much in a very so short time frame. Very <laughs> it was uh, a, and a lot of details in it. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, I like the way it was also very uh, practical and pragmatic as well, which I think is very much needed at this point. So, you know, practical um, stuff that's informed by, by obviously lots of background uh, research and, and literature is fantastic. All right, question time. Wow, there was a lot of chatting going on. <laughs> <laughs> it was mostly Tom talking about the pizza. <laughs> oh, that's that is my place, my go-to place for self-care. <laughs> I have have an, uh, have an international pizza challenge with uh, James Clay in the UK and uh, oh really with Ellen Levine in in America. So uh, I've got to say, I I always win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and um. I, it's a very small number, so we can do it that way. Jyoti? Oh, oh. Jyoti and then Neil. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Miguel. Uh, Lisa, I uh, really enjoyed that presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I was uh, just wondering, if it's an academic question. Uh, can you, uh, I, I, I enjoyed teaching online this semester. It was a nightmare, but I enjoyed it. I had to teach SQL Server and SAP in the same unit. Oh, wow, okay. The, <laughs> when, when I, yeah, it, it was painful and fun at the same time. I had students in three different countries apart from Australia who had to log in and use the platforms. Uh, uh, and um, when I started, the university hadn't figured out how to give large numbers of students access to the physical labs. So it took uh, quite a bit of time while I played uh, systems uh, ad admin uh, to mm. get things started. But I think uh, students have been very receptive. Um, there are students who have an absolute block against online teaching. Um, I don't know. Um, it, it, if the, but that's a very small number. The others, if you make the sessions interactive, and I, uh, my face-to-face -face sessions were interactive anyway, so I found it easy to port what I was already doing to the online environment. Um, uh, I guess my uh, question is um, more theoretical. Um, you talked about a lot of learning theories, and I, this is the professional development bit. And I, I have to, um, I, I think a lot of academics are doing now, uh, getting some professional development around uh, the recognition around the teaching work we do, because teaching, we were told, is a way to kill your career once upon a time. They are mm. encouraging more of that. And I, I don't know how many people got research done this time. Um, but if you are building in the teaching space, I mean, what, where do you uh, uh, recommend you one looks for theories? I'm not a researcher in the, in the education space. I do research in supply chain management. So how would I uh, do, get started with that body of literature? Um, there's a couple of uh, different books. I, I really like the book from Michael Moore and Greg Kearsley, uh, where they talk about online education um, from a distance education, 
the online learning from a systems view where they look at it as a system because distance education or online learning really isn't, um, a, a, it doesn't happen in a silo. It's a holistic experience. It, it impacts all parts of the organization, whether it's administrative, whether it's support, whether it's technology, whether it's teaching, um, it's design. So you need to have, uh, you need to approach it um, from a systems perspective. So I would definitely recommend that book. Um, I would buy it used because there wasn't a lot of really big new stuff in the latest edition and it's a little bit pricey. The book is a little bit pricey, uh, unless you can get your, your university to pay for it. Um, I, uh, can you, you repeat the name of the book and the author? Yeah, it's, it's in the list of, in the list of the, um, of the, uh, oh, Jyoti, there's a Google, Google, Google Doc, Doc that I can share with you. Yes, yes. Oh, there's a Google Doc, yeah. So there, yes. there's quite a lot this of references the there. There we go. <laughs> this is oh, the okay. I recognize it now. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, and and yeah. Moore also talks about this, his theory of transactional distance, which I think mm -hmm. is very helpful um, because it talks about, for example, how much dialogue, how much structure you need within your course and how that impacts the psychological distance that you're students are experiencing in the classroom right. so okay oh, uh, that's great thank you because um i don't know how it is across all the universities here but now they uh, the university requires us to apply for a fellow in higher education uh, academy okay. in the uk um and i have never done any research in the uh, online education space so thank you very much uh, for your presentation today and, and uh, Definitely follow different blogs. I put in a number of different mm -hmm. blogs uh, within the resources. Um, follow these guys. They have so many good ideas and so many of them are doing things like Dave Cormier, the, the MOOC guy, um, mm -hmm. who I actually, that picture that I posted of, of the, the Sagrada Familia, that was, uh, I actually went there with him and that picture was when I was there with him and we both found out we had a fear of heights. But anyway, um, <laughs> he's, he's written a lot about um, you know how to move into online learning and and you know and he's done it in a way that's very pragmatic so i i can recommend a, a lot of the videos that he's doing people like brian lamb uh you know people like like tony bates you know they're all getting into the trenches right now and trying to help people and trying to use that experience they aren't and i and i and i try not to complain about this too much but they aren't the type of professors or educators that want to lecture you or tell you about theory and you know tell you all about everything that they know uh, they really want to help you and they want to provide you with practical pragmatic solutions to the challenges that that you're facing as educators and and this I think is what is really needed right now and not a talking head who's going to tell me about different theories um, and you know what they do so and one one quick tip would be uh, follow follow these people on Twitter um, exactly. You know, so that's a, that's a way of really curating um, stuff that you're interested in. If you're interested in uh, learning theory and new learning theories, then just follow them on Twitter. Thank, Thank you, Jolton. Neil, Neil uh, you had a question, I think. Yep. Oh, um, thank you, Lisa. Um, I thought that was a lovely uh, presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I asked a question in the chat, which was, um, what tools would you recommend for e-portfolios e and several people answered uh, WordPress and Weebly for education and Mahara and then I was talking with some colleagues this morning about Google Drive and Google Sites uh, I just wondered if you had any other uh, suggestions yeah those are all really good examples um, uh, we use WordPress at University of, of Oldenburg, but that's because we're faced with the GDPR problem, um, the, the data protection rights. I don't know if you guys have the same um, issues there, but the, the Germans have taken this very seriously to the point that we can hardly use any media at all within our classes. Uh, but all of the data has to be stored within Europe. And so they have a big problem with using anything with Google, anything that's based in the United States. Um, so if you're faced with GDPR, WordPress has a number of different options that, that will help you get around it. It's not been an issue with other countries. It's mostly just Germany. So I would recommend Weebly is, is very good. Uh, uh, I, I also like PB Works. I created my first one on PB Works. Um, I, I would like to eventually move to Weebly. Um, 
and I've also had students who have used Google Sites and, and Google Docs to create their ePortfolios. So uh, those, are, those are really the ones that are out there um, right now that everyone's using that are free and available. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Neil. Anyone else? I've overwhelmed people with too much information in a short <laughs> period of time. <laughs> oh, there's Don. Sorry. Hi there, Lisa. Thank you very much for your um, presentation and a lot of nice practical tips there. I, I think along with um, what Neil was asking there, um, that just some other, I guess, springboard questions um, where we're moving on to online assessment and, and, and we're using reflection a lot more as well. Um, so to try to promote that self-directed or um, a, approach and, and for them to um, con consider uh, if I, I'm a back, have a background in physiotherapy. So while we can't do the practical, we need to be reflective of uh, um, or cases that they've come across. Have you got some springboard ideas as far as how to start students in reflection, especially if this is something that is new to them? Um, I, what I what I what I like to do first is to get them to reflect on the content. I know a lot of times you get the ref, they reflect back what they've read, uh, and then I'll ask them to dig deeper into the content. For mm -hmm. example, let's say they're reading about um, a specific theory within distance education or the, a specific event within online learning that has occurred, uh, and then I ask them, okay how do you understand this event and can you relate it to your own personal experience provide an example of that uh, or can you see opportunities to apply this within your current work practice um, and so it, it's an attempt to make it more relevant to them uh, and so what i'll try to do is is to get them to think about not just the text itself or what it th that i want them to learn but how they might apply it within mm. other situations uh, or, or how they have done it in the past. Hmm. And what I also find to be helpful is asking students to share their reflections. And students have done this. They've, they've done this um, not just in text, but they've done videos uh, about mm -hmm. where they've reflected on things and, uh, and they've shared it with the class. And uh, so other students get the benefit and also an idea of how to move along in the reflective process. but I'm sure that you have a lot of ideas coming from the field that you do. <laughs> yeah, we, we have been using um, video reflections. So um, submitting them through the likes of, we use Blackboard and, and our university and, and that can be peer reviewed as well. So that's been quite nice. Um, and and I, I guess rather than everything being written, yeah, it, it is trying to be innovative in, in these approaches to reflect, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Anyone else? Uh, Lisa, I have a question, if, if no one has any. <laughs> Have you come across like, oh, have you done anything at at scale? Like I'm I'm like talking about thousand plus students or somewhere close to two thousand students. So then, quite a lot of things that we 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 could do quite well actually becomes a limitation itself. For example, feedback, uh, or even assessing and on formative, and it actually even trying to encourage any sort of interaction. I guess that's a bonus in an online space uh, that with a big class you're bound to get a lot of lot of interaction, a bit of noise, but that's that's all part of the ambience. But are there any tips that or things that you've experienced in, in, in teaching at a, in a big class? I've never had to teach a big class. Um, I've never taught a MOOC, for example. Uh, but many of our students at the University of South Africa have have students or have had to teach large numbers of students. Uh, and what they've done, the different approaches that they've used, uh, I know at UNISA has be, have been to um, to create smaller groups that that so that they're then doing group projects and then they'll present the results of those group projects to have mentors that guide the students. So they'll have perhaps one mentor for 50 students. 
uh, and that they, they feed then the, the most important issues to the, to the instructor who then feeds it back, feeds back responses to the students. So I think there's a number of ways that, that, that you can provide support or to help students learn in that kind of environment as well using the technology. But I think a lot of it is, is really maximizing the affordances of, of collaboration in an online environment. Uh, and yeah, just really using collaboration in that, in that kind of environment. Not, not just to do d development and, and, and writing and designing, but also to do assessment <coughs> within yeah. a peer environment. Thank you, Lisa. Um, anyone else? James, you're very quiet today. Hey, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am here and I am listening, but I'm also uh, like multitasking. <laughs> I yeah, I, I suspect I've he had his virtual reality I feel held on. Terribly guilty. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm actually, actually, to be honest, I'm sitting here preparing um, our uh, course content for our second week of our official online uh, uh, teaching because I, I'm actually involved in a trimester institution that. Um, uh, we sort of just got through our first semester with only one uh, lecture and tutorial in uh, in online, which was essentially uh, right at the end revision. And uh, for that particular lecture, I basically just recorded uh, most of my content and then sat there with, I think, one student that decided to come online with me. Um, but uh, yeah, so what my... Um, my peculiarities are at the moment is I teach uh, game design and virtual reality and augmented reality development. And so the, the complications have come into the fact that I can teach the software and I can teach the theory and I can, um, you know, develop tutorials and other things that allow them to, to uh, you know, simulate these environments. However, the, the biggest um, complexity that I have is that they cannot experience the, the virtual and augmented reality environments that they could within a, um, within a physical in situ classroom. Um, now, to try to send out, you know, uh, virtual reality or mobile devices to, um, in my case, it's 30 odd students. Students. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. Mm. So what would be your advice when we obviously have these types of uh, very practical um, based uh, subjects and the limitations of especially the expense of trying to send out these types of, of hardware. Now I'm doing it by essentially saying to them, here is software, here are simulations, um, I have videos that say, you know, if you press play, this is what you will see. But if you connect your hardware, it's literally no other buttons, no other things. And this is how it would work in the hardware. So I've obviously come, you know, with solutions there, but they don't get to experience it. <laughs> and that to me is the, is the, is the bit that's missing with the um, capacity to deliver our content online is that some of the experience gets lost. So I was just wondering if you could comment on that as I literally sit here creating all of this content in front of me across 10 windows and all the rest of it. As I said, I, I really engaged with your presentation because I was thinking as I did this that I'm, I'm adopting a lot of what you're talking about in, in the methods and look, we haven't really received much training around any of this. It's, it's mainly due to, you know, being in, in these amazing communities, uh, part of the Ascolite community, part of this mobile learning community, uh, plus a lot of the work that I do in innovation that I've been able to do that. But what are your thoughts about that experience, especially when it relates to hardware or, 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 or other type of practicals? 
challenging, hugely challenging. Um, I, other than you know, walking them through or showing them videos on on how it can be done, or actually doing it, you know, like a, a YouTube video of this is how you you know put all the pieces together. Um, that would be you know the only thing that I could really I guess recommend is 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 to you know put together some videos, but. Uh, another possibility might be to in, in include experts um, where your experts come in and then provide tips and feedback um, and and guide them through different things if they're if they're struggling um, i don't i don't know what kind of support are you the only support person they have oh yep yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what am i what is it the 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 all all and sundry um, okay. but i'm also the expert and and the the developer and the designer and the the whole kit and caboodle. <laughs> um, so I guess it's probably not so much that that's the struggle in terms of being able to provide them examples and videos and that. It's it's the experience. It's the experiential mm. side of online learning that I query. Um, that we can provide them so much in terms of you know, two dimensions or, or, or that side. But when it comes to multi-dimensional experience, and it's not just related to virtual or augmented reality or mobile learning or, or these types of things, it, it comes to things like practicals, um, you know, where you're, you might be in uh, nursing or, uh, or medicine or, or looking at, at, at other types of things where Yes, you can try to simulate it through two-dimensional means, but there is no uh, substitution to um, in situ in simulation unless, of course, you have extremely expensive, um, you know, digital simulation tools, which to try to rapidly construct those for, um, mm. you know, in a week or two or even a month, is, is impossible because they require significant testing, they require significant development. And for most uh, learning modules, I would, I would doubt that, that the tools themselves can even be scaled to a, to a point where there is a value associated there, unless it was a massive MOOC or uh, you can construct the materials and try to sell them in an online fashion that, that other institutions could adopt or whether you're a Pearson or, or a Wiley or something mm. where you can do that. So again, I, I just asked that question because it's the one bit that, that often doesn't get spoken about is how can we create those authentic experiences beyond the two dimensions? See, I think that's 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 something we could spend an entire webinar. Oh, I know, on. I know, I know, I know. Maybe, maybe that should be our next webinar. And, <laughs> maybe and, that uh, is. Maybe yeah. But look, as I said, I mean, very, very interesting. But it is um, incredibly topical, and that's the that's yeah. the thing that people are really struggling with. How do you do this stuff online? That you that you know, like like Todd was saying, how do you do physiotherapy online? Um, and I think on, on that note, I think we should also acknowledge that there are limitations to what we can do. I mean, there are things which we will try and replicate on an, uh, in an online environment. It, it will never be the same. So Meredith is just agreeing with us. That should be the topic of our next webinar. <laughs> and maybe we'll invite Lisa to uh, participate in that one as well, um, but, but not have to be the, the full presenter. <laughs> well, just reali realizing that we're actually um, way beyond our time. It's, it's already been an hour. Yeah, I think we have to wind it up. But um, yeah. big thank you. Big thank, thank you to you Lisa for, and, and yeah. spending all that time. And, and for, for yeah. being here and, and for making time for us. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for people that came and participated today. Right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you guys later. See ya. Have a great weekend. You too. And just keep safe. And um, yeah, hope things improve in USA and, and yeah, yeah, Homeland. I know what it feels like. Probably I can. And um, in the world. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm going to stop Out. the recording now.